Today, let us discuss about uh, a Global Hunger Index. It is part of your 15th October 2015 newspaper. Global Hunger Index, uh, it is very much squarely fits into our syllabus. If you look about uh, issues of development, uh, issues related to poverty and hunger, it is part of our syllabus. Now, any argument which you make up, uh, you can relate with the Global Hunger Index and you can strengthen your argument. In this context, what is Global Hunger Index is all about? Now, there is an organization called International Food Policy Research Institute. Every year it is giving its report from 2006 onwards and it is a decade old report. Last report, it has said, building the resilient communities that can face the climate change and the consequences can save the world from the hunger in the future. The highlight of this report uh, this year is the armored conflicts uh, they are making the world uh, retrogressive. So I have a beautiful point for you. Conflict is development in reverse. So in this case it is worsening the situation of um, food insecurity and hunger in the world. Now on what criteria we take this uh, global hunger index? This year it is changed and we have four criteria. One is stunting, wasting, undernourishment and under five child ma uh, mortality. All four factors they are included with regard to this particular thing. So now in this uh, where India stands. So India has improved its position this year. It has come to 55 out of 76 emerging economies. So in this context, what are the reasons for increasing or betterment of India's position? The first is ICDS program if you observe. A national rural health mission like that many nutritional programs were launched by the government in the post-2006 scenario. They have reduced the hunger to large extent. But in India, the hidden hunger is still a major challenge. In this case, there are remarkable differences across the states. And the report says that open defecation is one of the major reasons for the undernourishment among the children. And report also says that the conditions of hunger, undernourishment have increased in India. But chronic malnutrition and stunting of the growth, these still are the remarkable challenges to this country. Now it further explains, the green revolution in India, one way it was a dividend, on the other way it has pushed the country into hidden hunger. A hidden hunger it means, the micronutrient deficiency, I say hidden hunger synonymous with micronutrient deficiency. So vitamin A deficiency leading to night blindness, Iodine deficiency leading to mental disorders in the new offspring and uh, various other iron deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies, all these are increasing in the Indian population. So we have carbohydrate um, centered nutritional security but neither the protein nor the micronutrients. So the uh, report uses a term that is called as um, Triple burden to India. What is this triple burden? The nutritional transition is happening in India where we are shifting from conventional, traditional, unprocessed foods or minimally processed foods to highly processed foods. These highly processed foods essentially miss something called as micronutrients. And also they are the reason for obesity. And we have undernourishment. A country with obesity, micronutrient deficiency, undernourishment. So this is what is described as the triple burden of India. Now, what we have to do to face this situation? Now, the sustainable developmental goals. So these are post-millennium developmental goals. The sustainable development goals. They want to achieve certain objectives by 2030. In this, the second goal clearly talks about ending the hunger 
and uh, ushering, bringing in food security into the country or into the world. So India has to strive to achieve this. So in this context, if you observe that, the Indian Food Security Act, it also emphasizes on the carbohydrate nutrition. So we have to fight this hidden hunger because it's going to decrease the productivity of our human resources into future. The micronutrients have to be specifically focused. Next is, if you remember the Swachh Bharat, the report has specifically linked the food insecurity in India due to open defecation. Because of this open defecation, the ability of a child to observe the food is decreasing. So it means whatever he consumes, it is con not converting into something called as energy which he can use for day to day life. So the open defecation has to be avoided under any circumstances in India. It is the major reason for ill health and food insecurity and failure for the human body to absorb the consumed nutrients. And let's go to the next article. It's a beautiful article. Now, I always tell to my students in the class, technology will not lead to learning outcomes. A teacher cannot be replaced by technology. Technology at best can assist the teacher to deliver the learning outcomes. This is always my standpoint. Many of my friends suggested me to go or launch some technical platform to teach better to the students. Then I said, the technology shall have its own space. The technology shall not dominate the human interaction between the teacher and student. This is what I believed always. Now, there is a study in Europe that is Program for International Student Assessment. What this study proved is this. The improved use of technology in the schools need not convert itself into learning outcomes. It has taken the learning outcomes of the children in Europe and compared them in Japan, Singapore, China, etc. Where the technology used in the school is less, student-teacher interaction is more. So in this context, the learning outcomes are better in these East Asian countries. Here, there are two points we need to note. One thing is, as technology increases in the class, then proportionately student-teacher exchange has to increase. So the technology, if it has to be taken to the people for their understanding, the teacher shall be more attentive and active to make it to reach to the people. And second thing is, the reliability and also the redundant information shall be filtered. Technology has given huge access to the information. In this context, providing for an information that is valuable for his understanding, a teacher can make a difference over here. So, if you take the Indian scenario, so entire, the, from 2000 onwards, if I see, it started, uh, this uh, technology drive in the primary education started in Madhya Pradesh, then went into southern states. Now this fixation has gone into northern states. In India, education has got mixed with the uh, World Bank populistic politics. So, free computers modern e-schools, techno-schools, etc. Especially if I take my state, Andhra Pradesh. Technology in the school, it is made the education more a commodity because by showing the technology, the school can attract them more and more students. So before every school, they attach some tagline, techno-school, e-techno-school, concept school. It is the, the fever not only there in the private schools, it is also entered into the government schools. So more the funds, if they are spent on the teachers and teacher training, then we can see the better results. Recently in uh, Uttar Pradesh, Allahabad High Court, uh, it wanted to get uh, Shiksha Karmis removed. How many of us know that? 
more than 60% of the schools in that state, they run on one single teacher who is not properly trained, that is Shiksha Karmi, who is supposed to be a teacher, assistant. So in this context, um, the technology is leading to the diversion of funds away from the real purpose to reach to the learning outcomes. If you can remember Akash tablets, the government, uh, previous government, Mr. Kapil Sibal, when he was the human resources minister, they are launched with a huge fanfare. But where do they stand now? So in this context, um, my carry home point is very simple. So I quote um, this piece of study with regard to the technology and role of technology, to what extent I can use to improvise the understanding and learning outcome of a child in the school. So I will try to update my class notes on education through this. Now, recently if you see, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she has visited India. In this one point which has took the prominent uh, headlines, other than the trade and business, it is about increasing German teaching in Indian schools and also Hindi in German schools. It means they are laying a foundation for future interaction. Now, there is something called compatibility between these demographics. India is a place for youngest population with the high unemployment rates. On the other hand, the fertility rates in Germany are coming down. And Germany is majorly an export oriented market. If growth comes down in Germany, it is going to hurt the country badly. So, India uh, and its human resources can help the Germany to sustain its growth in the future. So, in this case, the influx of the refugees, it may act as a hindrance for this uh, demographic compatibility. The end population is entering into Germany. It means... Uh, Germany, if he is providing space for more refugees, it means it is getting compatible human force or workforce which is necessary for productivity in the future. So that may hurt the India's interest. But I don't see that way. The reason is this. The refugees, their skills that matter the most over here. Generally, when a migrant from India to moves to America or some other country, so in the Europe and US, mostly from India, the skilled migrants moves over there. So unless in these refugees, the skills are nurtured, they may not be useful for productivity. The Indian human resources are like um, a ready-made products for use in the industrial uh, sector. So this is what is the thing. And the next is importance of Article 370. Now the Jammu and Kashmir High Court has given a judgment in which it has made a comment um, about the permanency of Article 370. And you all know that um, there are three agendas for BJP. One is to do away with Article 370, to bring uniform civil code, and uh, you all know that Ram Temple. So in this um, Article 370 issue, it was made in a context of um, 77th Constitutional Amendment Act. So it provides for reservations um, in the case of promotions. Now, Anything if it has to be applied, any constitutional amendment to be applied to the Jammu and Kashmir, a presidential order is necessary for this purpose. So, the High Court over there squashed down this particular 77th Amendment Act as not applicable to Jammu and Kashmir because there was no presidential order is issued to extend this to that particular state. Above all, if you see the Article 370 closely, it is the link that brought India close to Jammu and Kashmir. But over a period of time, the governments of India, they got greater powers through various presidential orders. Almost, they extended the authority of many union government institutions into Jammu and Kashmir. Before 1954, if you observe, India has the power in Kashmir only on three issues. That is defense, telecommunications, and the third thing is about external affairs. Now almost um, the entire union list can be implemented in uh, Jammu and Kashmir. The most of the constitutional provisions they are applicable in Jammu and Kashmir. 
Here there is one challenge. The permanent resident status. It is not leading to the intermixing of other people or migration of the other people into Jammu and Kashmir. Especially Kashmir Valley. What the Sangh Parivar thinks is the dilution of the demographic character can change the attitude of the Kashmiris towards India. Now if you see, in Sri Lanka, why the Tamils have hated and went through the, through the LTTE? One of the major reasons is uh, the government of the day, it was encouraging the Sinhali settlements um, in uh, East and North, um, the, especially in uh, this uh, Jaffna Peninsula, to dilute the Tamils and Tamil presence over there. So the RSS was trying to do the just same thing. So now here I want to take you a point. So as the elimination of the people happens, increases with India, and making Kashmir as a part of India is going to be a distant dream. At least it is not wise to tinker, argue on 370 till the Kashmir issue is settled between India and Pakistan. So that's what is the article says. And next is fresh challenges in the Northeast. Now if you remember the Prime Minister Modi, he himself announced about a historical agreement with the Nagas. But he did, he did not uh, give any detail about this Naga agreement. Actually it appeared further that um, it is just a framework agreement um, without any concrete proposal. Now the negotiations are further going on. So you know that um, there are many Naga people also live in Manipur. And uh, this NSCN Isaac Mubaya, they wanted to have greater Nagalim with areas from Manipur too. One such a suggestion itself has raised the huge violence in the Manipur. Now there are reports that NSCAN is using this particular phase to increase its recruits from Nagas in Manipur. It means it is throwing a new challenge to the Indian security establishment. Now what we have to think is this. So the government shall declare what is that framework agreement exactly is. Or else the outlines of that. And the civil society involvement of the local state governments that play a very critical role over here. I think this needs to be taken up. If not violence will return to the peaceful valley again. And the next is, this is a very good article for interview. Recently, I mean, also, I can say it this way, there are many traditions in India that leads to the intermingling of the people. So, I was, uh, as of now, I'm in Delhi. Deepavali is celebrated by Punjabis, that is, Sikh population in Punjabis, Hindus, uh, and even Muslims. So, that shows uh, an intermixing of various uh, religions and cultures in the idea of India celebrating a festival. If you go to Hyderabad during the Ramzan, everyone relishes the dish of uh, Haleem. So, in Western India, the Garba dance is one, where Hindus, Muslims and everyone, Jains, they dance together. That is a symbol of uh, a pluralistic culture, cultural harmony. So now if you see across the world, um, the, there are many new programs that are been coming up to develop the mutual respect for the people with other cultures in an interdependent world. In India, which is naturally a plural society, it is leading to more and more segregation. So, what they said is, Garba dance has to be done only by the people who have Tilak or on whom Go Mutra will be uh, I mean, spilled. So what is this all? We need to have more and more symbols where the religion and people can come together. So in this context, um, this particular American field services, that is a very good example how the people can learn about the cultures. Now if you take Navodaya Vidyalayas, there is something called migration at 7th class. The North Indian people will come to South Indian schools. Uh, South Indian people go to North Indian schools. That leads to better integration and interaction between the cultures. That is what is the need of the hour now in India. Now, the earliest and anger, India as a destination, you know that. Anywhere the stability exists there, 
the country will be a better destination for the investments. Now we have macroeconomic framework which is very much strong and next is you have social stability, political stability and also the low inflation and added to that the smart cities and growing infrastructure. These are all providing for the new opportunities for investments even for this foreign direct investments make in India all these things. So this is what is the Ernest Renning report talks about. So Man Booker Prize, I don't want to discuss about what this prize etc. You read the facts related to that. Thank you very much. Now I, it came to my notice today I was discussing with one of the students. Many of them are looking for these videos on uh, Insights website. But due to some technical issues, I am unable to post them over there. You can uh, access them on my Facebook group Rambabusar students or you can go it lyx.in. If you don't have a Facebook account, visit this website and do that in the lyx.in. There is a section called as videos. You can see all these videos over there. And make sure that you read that particular class notes which I give on that particular day. Because I am giving you some 200 to 300 words of typed material along with this video. Make sure that you read that. Because I keep lot of energies in making that particular notes. And I am making very much it relevant to your syllabus. Try to go through that and store it for future reference. Thank you very much.